Good evening and welcome to ATV News. I'm Charity Pepazani. Here are your top stories this Friday. The Asia Gate match fixing scandal that has haunted Zimbabwean football has taken a new twist. It is now alleged that some of the players implicated in the scandal were involved in sex orgies while in Malaysia. The Justice Ibrahim Commission is compiling a report into allegations that Zimbabwean players were paid to, to lose matches during tours of Asia between 2007 and 2009. According to the reports, officials and players were entertained with sex and drinks while on tour. Apparently, six officials were allowed to choose from 16 young women and were provided with a room for use. The report adds that the following day, Wilson Paramor Raj, the man behind the scandal, instructed the Zimbabwean team that they would be paid to lose the next match by two goals. In Malawi, the Democratic Progressive Party's regional governor for the South, Noel Masangwe, has been charged with murder in connection with the killing of a university student. Masangwe has been charged along with several others with the murder of Robert Chesowa. Kalenkeni Kampale, the lawyer representing Masangui and several others involved, confirmed that this, his clients were formally charged with murder in Blantyre Magistrate on Thursday. Chesowa, who studied engineering, was found dead at a college campus in Blantyre in September last year. Police said he had jumped to his death and produced bonga suicide notes as evidence. But an inquiry ordered by President Joyce Bander ruled that Chisowa had in fact been murdered. President Bander promised that the culprits would face the full wrath of the law. In a bizarre story from England, a Zimbabwean teenager was stabbed and bitten on the cheek before slipping into a psychosis that made him believe he was President Barack Obama. 19-year-old Tendai Kamosho was stabbed and bitten by 18-year-old Jordan Sinclair in a McDonald's restaurant in Northampton. Kamosho was treated in hospital and when the chick wound turned septic, he was put into a five-day coma. Following this, he began to suffer hallucinations and fully believed that he was President Obama. Sinclair has been sentenced to five years in jail for the attack while Kamosho is still being treated at a psychiatric hospital and has been sectioned under the Mental Health Act. The Miss Malaika UK beauty pageant will be held in England tomorrow. The Moomba's Children Project, based in the UK, will again host the event in London. This year, the project will be celebrating its 10th anniversary. The Children's Project was set up in memory of, of Moomba Brian Mulenga, who passed away in 2002 in a road accident, and it was founded by Hilda Mulenga. The beauty pageant consists of 10 contestants from Botswana, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The theme for this year will be road safety. And top model of the world 2011 from Romania, Laurentino Salanta, will be one of the special guests at this event. Earlier, I spoke to one of the organizers, Mr. Washington Ali, and I asked him about his involvement with Miss Malaika. I got involved in Miss Malaika going back to 2008, um, but Hilda had started it way back to 2006. Hilda lost her son, uh, who was called Mumba, and um, in recognition of the loss, she formed a charity in his name called Mumba Children's Project. Now, Mumba Children's Project is, is a charity uh, registered here uh, in the UK as a company limited by guarantee and also with the Charity Commission. And basically, <clears throat> it's to promote the health of um, African children. Um, and here in the diaspora, we do work with the youth, uh, the women, and part of um, the project of working with the youth and the women um, is the work we do at Miss Malaika. We train the girls um, etiquette, we um, train them on confidence, um, interview, getting jobs, um, self-confidence, um, and once we give them training, they'll also be able to participate at any um, pageant, whether national or international, because we also international accredited um, directors as well for other different pageants. 
So this is the that we are trying to um, continue to work with the youth platform to sort of like be seen because when we do Miss Malaika, there's so many people that come from different backgrounds. So how, how is it important that people should come and support Miss Malaika this Saturday? It is very important that people will come and support Miss Malaika because it is a beauty pageant um, with a style. We will have um, girls from Zimbabwe, Uganda, um, Zambia and Botswana coming to showcase um, and the theme for Miss Malaika this year is, is road safety. Right, this is in light with um, Mumba died in, a, in, a, in an accident. So basically each and every girl is going to be talking about um, road safety awareness. It is a different pageant, it is full of excitement, people will actually be sitting right on the edge of their chairs and the way we run our pageants, um, you will see it on the day when you come. We run it as professional as we possibly can and when you come to the show, I'm sure you are going to say, wow. Yesterday, we brought to you part one of our exclusive interview with Nathan Banana, the son of Zimbabwe's first president, Kane and Banana. Now, Liam brings us the second installment of the interview, where Nathan talks about his father and the upcoming elections in Zimbabwe. Now, moving to yourself, you've said that it was only a matter of time before you got involved with politics. Is it something that's in your blood? I wouldn't say anybody has it in their blood because in politics really it's all about the people. If the people feel that you should represent them then you take that, that, that duty as a duty to the nation. So I can't go back and say, okay here I am, I'm here to, to lead you now, so support me. No, I have to go out there, talk to the people, hear what they say. If they like my ideas then they will you know, obviously say, can you please represent us in our constituency or nationally or whatever the case may be. But I think you'd agree it's not been an easy ride. It's taken you several years just to get to this stage. What kind of challenges have you faced already? I think some of it is also based on fear. You know, my, 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 my mother hasn't been very comfortable about the whole idea. Uh, hence, I haven't actually gone into politics at all. I would rather maybe become a political blogger or commentator, or whatever the case may be. But she has her reasons for not wanting any of her siblings to go into politics. But I'm an independent person as well. I, I'm not going into politics because of my history or my parents, but because I also have a passion for people. I also want to help people. I can see their problems in society. And I've been talking a lot about these problems, but without being an active player myself, there's little change, there's little that I can change in society. So there has to come a time where I will also try and see if I can uh, implement some of my ideas, share some of my ideas with the community, so that then they can perhaps start believing that perhaps, yes, we have found the right leader for us. It sounds there like you faced a real moral dilemma. Is this something, therefore, that you just felt you had to do? That's true. You briefly mentioned your father there. How much of an influence was he on yourself and your politics? Uh, he, was, he was quite a big influence in, in that I used to see what work he used to do when he was in, in, in a position of leadership. He was a people's person, is what I can say. Um, he used to, be, to get practically involved on the ground in various projects with the people on the ground, not just um, speak from a high platform or in an authoritative way. So his relationship with the community is what probably inspires me as well. I want to be with the people, understand the people all the time. I don't want to be disconnected. Though I know when you get into government sometimes the amount of work you have to do might result in you being slightly disconnected and relying on people like advisors for information. But that is something which I think needs to be improved. Um, I would like to see that with our own politicians as well. More conversations rather than just um, uh, election campaigns. But he didn't have it all his own way and there was allegations and some feel he was treated badly towards the end of his career. 
Did that ever put you off going into politics, being in that position of a public eye? I would say in the early days, yes, because um, it comes as a bit of a shock when you, you hear all these kind of allegations coming out. And the only thing that you can do is rely on the, the knowledge of the person who you directly know. If they tell you what they think about the whole situation, they say blood is thicker than water. So I'd rather believe what my father tells me than what I read in the press. And you talk about the press there. And if you were to be in a position of power, you'd have to have a relationship with them. And in the media, we know there are different organizations with different agendas. How would you make that balance work? I think in life, we have to accept that there's people who always have something to say. Uh, it can be positive, it can be negative. And the negative reasons or positive reasons have uh, something that can develop us to be better people. So it's not that when people say something negative about you, you should just dismiss it and uh, counter, counter uh, attack it in, in any particular way. It's time to reassess and look at what they're trying to say and investigate deeper to find if you can work around that particular situation. And would you say perhaps the things that you went through with your father and the press would have helped you develop a thick skin for this kind of stuff? Yes, yes. I mean, I read all kind of comments from the public about the issue and uh, with the support of friends and fam close family, um, they would tell me, listen, people will have something to say. So you, you shouldn't hold any grudge against people because they, do, they don't know. They're actually in a position where they have got less knowledge than you do. So if you want them to know anything, you should speak out and say what you think. If you don't speak out, people will never know what the truth is. Now moving to the current political situation in Zimbabwe, elections are not far away. How confident are you of free and fair elections? I must say I'm a, I'm a bit worried about the elections because not much in terms of reform has taken place within government. Um, the elections are supposed to be guided by the GPA agreement, which outlines the conditions for free and fair elections. And um, we're still struggling to conclude the constitution. And there's no reforms really that have actually taken place in terms of making the changes necessary to have that free and fair envir environment, besides a few changes in uh, legislation in, in terms of uh, IEPA and uh, things like that. But um, I am skeptical. Skeptical. Yeah. Now, famously, your father was involved with the ZANU party, but you said you'd like to strike out on your own, and that's because of the, a lack of opportunities for young aspiring politicians to join the major parties. Why is that? We've had a president for over 32 years. Um, if we had had, in these uh, three decades, three different presidents, I would say there is opportunity. But as you can see in, in, in top leadership, it's more or less the same people on the top structures. So if you're an aspiring leader, I don't, I'm not sure if you'd be comfortable in staying in the same position forever. You'd also want to try and see if you can go up the ranks of the party. Finally, in your work, you've talked about a potential five-year plan. So where do you see yourself in five years? And what can you realistically achieve in that quite small period of time? It, it's, it's very difficult for me to say conclusively how I'm going to approach the political situation in Zimbabwe. Because I first need to go back and be in Zimbabwe on the ground and have first-hand experience, engage people and see what's happening on the ground. Through that information, I can then start building up a plan on how I think I can contribute to the development of Zimbabwe. Maybe I might not need to be a politician. Maybe there are other ways that I can contribute without actually being in a position of authority. Well, we wish you the best of luck, Nathan. Thank you very much for joining us on ATV. Thanks. Thanks. For your sports news, here are Liam and Michael to talk about a big weekend in English Premier League with some top-of-the-table clashes. That's right, Charity. Me and Michael are back, hoping to make a better stab of things with our predictions this week. It's a big weekend in the Premier League, and Sunday particularly, we'll have some really, really important games. We'll start, though, with Arsenal. Now they take on QPR at home and it's safe to say Arsenal have had a terrible week. They lost at Norwich last week, 1-0, to 
frankly a struggling side and then midweek in the Champions League they lost 2-0 to Schalke at home I mean devastating results for Arsenal but it's QPR at home that shouldn't affect things too much should it? Well no when Arsenal are down they're really down so it's, it's going to be a pretty t- tricky match considering QPR I think a season or two ago beat Arsenal so probably maybe a draw Well because I was going to say QPR our bottom of the table, they're rooted to the bottom with just three points for, at this stage in the season. But Norwich haven't been doing too well, and they got three points last week. Yeah, and, and besides, there's a rivalry between the two since they're both in London, and QPR will obviously want to do well. You find players like uh, Tabat, he plays better when he's playing against Arsenal for some reason. Probably he's trying to market himself or something, but yeah. Now also it was the Arsenal annual general meeting this week and there's quite a lot of grumblings from supporters basically saying that Arsene Wenger isn't doing enough and some are even saying that it's time for him to go. Now Mike, as an Arsenal fan, is his time up? Well, as an Arsenal fan, I think definitely his time is up. Football has moved on from uh, when he was a very, very successful friend find that trying maybe to copy the United format when when Alex Ferguson came I think he went about four years without winning anything and during that time they were rebuilding the stadium to get more funds in order to compete but nowadays you don't rely on the income from the team it's either you've got a rich person putting his money there or you're not in the game. Now the only good news really for Arsenal this week was that potentially their star midfielder Jack Wilshire could return after a very lengthy absence. Now how important could he be for the rest of the season? <laughs> well, it's always tricky when a player is coming back from injury. Look at uh, Ramsey when he went, before he was injured, he was very, very promising, but nowadays he has most clumsy days than good days. So it depends which Jack Wilshire comes back. And, and plus, there's too much emphasis on him at the moment, which he doesn't need. I was going to say that. There's a lot of pressure on him. The fans need to be patient, don't they? Yeah, they definitely need to be patient. And he's, he's only a, a young lad and let him play, enjoy the football, and that's it. OK, all that being said, what's it, are you really going to go for a draw? I am going to go for a draw. OK, one all. one all. OK, I've got a bit more faith in Arsenal. I think QPR are really struggling this season. And uh, I think Arsenal's attack will be too much, so I'm going for a 2-0 win. Well, another team that had a really awful week in Europe is Manchester City. They were well beaten, 3-1 at Ajax, a game they were really expected to win. And they now find themselves in a very tricky position if they want to qualify from their group in the Champions League. Also in the Premiership, they haven't been on their top form. And last week, it took two late Edin Dzeko goals to escape from what would have been a defeat at West Brom. So they will see this game at home to Swansea City as an absolute must win. Not just for the points on the table, but for morale of the team. Also, Roberto Mancini has come under some criticism for his constant changing of tactics mid-game. Even his own player, Mika Richards, came out after the Ajax game with some criticism. So, City, it was a tough week, tough week really. 3-1 at Ajax. I mean, that's a, a result no one really expected. Well, if, if you're playing with a back line of three and those three defenders are not playing particularly well, you're obviously going to get hammered, more so if you're away from home. What we discussed last week... They've, they've had a couple of games in the Premiership where they've just scraped through. Is this going to be one of those, or are they going to win comfortably? It's going to be one of those that they will just scrape through, because at the moment City are not playing as a team. It's just uh, individual players pulling them through. Sometimes you have Aguero, then you have Guateco as well, that kind of thing. And interestingly, Swansea, last week, after a very poor start to the league, got their first win in six games, so they'll be full of confidence, won't they? They'll think they can go there and get a result. If, if you look at the Swansea games, it may be their first win, but they pushed United all the way. They pushed uh, uh, is it Chelsea again. So all the teams they've played with, they've play, played really well and managed to score maybe one or two or three goals, but still did not do enough to win. So it's not like they were playing badly. And the funny thing with City is after winning the Premiership last year, Suddenly, Roberto Mancini finds himself in a bit of a precarious position, doesn't he? 
Yeah, uh, it's always difficult when we, when you win the first one, then you need to win the second one after that because people expect more. That's when there's added pressure. With the first one, it was more or less like one on the very last minute. So you can see how hard it was for them. All that being said, I'm going to wuss out and still say I think City are going to comfortably win this one because they are at home and I think there'll be a reaction to that Ajax game. So I'm going for 3-0. Is that a bit too big for its scoreline for you? It is. I'm going for 3-2. Three, 3-2. Two. Three, two. Well, yeah. that would be a cracking game. We'll see how that one turns out. Now, as I said, Sunday, two massive games and we start with the Merseyside derby, Liverpool versus Everton. Now, after a slow start to the league this season, Liverpool have started to get a few wins. They won last weekend in the league against Reading and they won midweek against Anzi, the Russian side. Both 1-0 wins, but it was important for them to get those two wins. Everton, as everyone knows, has had a blistering start to the league and sit in fourth place at the moment. Although their last two games were draws, so there may be signs that they're slowing down a little bit. I think it's going to be a close game and as Merseyside derbies are, always very, very feisty and aggressive. I'm actually going to go for a two-all draw here, Mike. What do you think? I'm, I'm going for a win for Everton. And why is that? Uh, simply because they've won, I think, the last six games they've played at home against Liverpool. So they will definitely win, maybe by a score of 2-1. And when we look at Liverpool, they, they had their worst start in something like 100 years this year. But Brendan Rodgers is bringing in a totally new type of football. That was always going to take time, wasn't it? It, it always takes time when you have a new coach bringing in a new philosophy. But more so if the coach has limited resources. I don't understand why the Liverpool owners gave Kenny Daglish about, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 odd millions to spend. And they can't give this guy a penny. Well, exactly. As we say, it's going to be a big game and both fans will be absolutely desperate that their side wins so they have bragging rights and they're going to work on Monday. Now we said there will be a top of the table clash and this is quite literally it. Chelsea versus Man United, first v second, old rivals and it's bound to be a thriller. Chelsea, another team who struggled in Europe midweek, they lost away at Shakhtar 2-1 and were quite comfortably beaten to be honest. Now, interestingly, United were the only team that won in the Champions League, but they had to fight back from 2-0 down against Braga, with the little P, Hernandez, scoring twice. Again, though, they look very troubled at the back. And personally, I think that Chelsea's little attacking players, Hazard, Mata, maybe even Oscar, will be too much for Man United's weakened defence. I've got this at 2-1 to Chelsea. What do you think, Mike? I've got it at 2-1 to Chelsea as well. Uh, did you see my notes before? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, simply because uh, Chelsea have got a lot of uh, firepower up front, whereas United are weak in defence and you've got Ferdinand again, who's quite slow compared to the faster players. I'd like to see how Torres will fare against Ferdinand. It's interesting as well that United's attacking players are basically having to outscore how many goals their defence concede. Uh, do you not see them doing that in this game? It's hard because Chelsea defend well as a team as well because you, you find the midfield draws back to help out, you find even the strikers help out as well. So for United to score more than Chelsea will score, that's hard. And what about that game in the Champions League for Chelsea? A bit of an unexpected loss. Do you think they'll bounce back from that or the heads will be down? I think generally Chelsea haven't been playing well against the continental sides. I don't know, maybe it's because they play the similar football which is fast paced and stuff. Whereas with the Premier League, uh, it's more tactical. Now just a little interesting point here. Man United have gone behind in 8 out of 12 games so far this season. And they've come back in many of those to win. So if they do go 1-0 down, United fans can still have the confidence that they can pull it back. Either way, me and Mike both think Chelsea will have just that bit too much and will cement their place at the top of the league. Join us on Monday to find out how right we were and who has the bragging rights around the ATV office. Join us then. Today's photo of the day has been awarded to Elias Takarusenga. Keep sending us your great pictures to our ATV Facebook page and you could appear on the big screen. Thank you for watching ATV News and have a lovely weekend.